Welcome back to Hardware Unbox. Today, we're gonna to walk you through our updated monitor testing suite and methodology that we've spent quite a lot of time overhauling for 2021. These changes are set to give you guys more information than ever into the monitors we test, as well as provide more accurate results that are even more representative of what you'll be seeing with your eyes than ever before. This video will also serve as a great opportunity to learn about what response times actually are and how they are calculated, what artifacts like ghosting, smearing, and inverse ghosting represent and what overshoot means. We get these questions on our monitor reviews pretty much daily, so this video will be a great resource to revisit if you want to learn more about monitors and monitor testing. However, I will put a disclaimer on this video that some of the explanations here are gonna be pretty technical, especially later in the video when we talk about the updates we've made for 2021. However, I've tried to make this video as simple to understand and as straightforward as possible, so hopefully you'll be able to follow along. I'm gonna start this video by explaining how we've tested response times previously and what a response time actually is. I think a lot of people know that response times refer to how fast a monitor can transition from one color to another with lower response times being better, but exactly what this looks like can be a mystery unless you've done a lot of research into monitor technology. Ideally, a monitor would transition between colors instantly. This would provide the best, clearest image with the least blur. However, in practice, especially for LCD monitors, it takes some time for the crystals within the monitor panel to physically move from one position to another. And it's this repositioning that changes the colors you're seeing on screen. Measuring this transition or response time gives us insights into how fast the monitor is. As measured by our photo detector tools that we use for monitor reviews, this is what a typical LCD monitor response time actually looks like. Along the x-axis, we have time in milliseconds, and along the y-axis, we have brightness in nits. Our tool actually produces a voltage readout, but this can be mapped directly to nits thanks to how the sensor operates. What we're looking at here is the monitor's actual response when asked to change from showing a full black image to full white. So down here in this lower steady state period, we have the monitor showing black. Up here, we have the monitor showing white at a higher brightness level. In between is the transition period, which we want to be as close to zero as possible. So how exactly do we measure this time period? Generally in engineering, when you measure a rise or fall time, this being a rise time, you use the 1090 rule. That is to say, you start measuring the rise time when the output reaches 10% of its final value and you stop measuring when it reaches 90%. So let's put these points in on the graph and you'll see it's a neat 10% tolerance at each end. The rise time or response time in the case of a monitor ends up being the time difference between these two points here. The other important measurement to make is overshoot. The response we just looked at did not feature any overshoot, so let's overlay a response that does. You'll see that generally the response time will decrease when measured this way, which is better. However, there's this hump added on top where the response overshoots the final value as it attempts to transition quicker. We measure overshoot as a percentage, so let's put some numbers on this graph. Let's say this initial point here is zero, this final point is one, and the peak of the overshoot is 1.2. This would indicate a 20% overshoot. When we measure the response time and overshoot for a range of greater grade transitions, we can then plot them on the heat map charts you might have seen in many of our monitor reviews. From there, we can calculate all the averages and other figures that are shown beneath the charts. The reason we're interested in response times and overshoot is that it directly relates to four common artifacts you'll see with displays. Ghosting, smearing, refresh blending, and inverse ghosting. So let's describe these so you know what they are. Ghosting can occur when you have slow response times. It's the phenomenon where after a monitor changes from one frame to the next frame, the old frame still faintly appears on the screen and fades away over time. This is most noticeable when you have an object moving around the screen. These faint old images will appear as a ghost trail behind that object. The slower the response times, the more noticeable ghosting will be as the ghost image will be clearer and take longer to fade. Smearing is essentially the same thing as ghosting, however it tends to apply more specifically to high refresh rate monitors. Smearing is most visible when an object is moving across the screen throughout multiple frames and only moves a small distance in each frame. If the monitor's response times are too slow, each of these frames will still be showing part of old frames. And if the response times are slow enough that it takes multiple frames to transition fully, smearing will blur the object itself and create blurred trails on either side, hence smearing the object across the screen. Refresh blending is also a byproduct of slow response times. 
blending occurs when a monitor is asked to change the frame it is displaying before it is finished updating the previous frame. As an example, let's go back to our response time graph for a moment and say that the time it takes to transition here is 10 milliseconds. However, we have a 144 Hz display, so at its fastest, the display may be asked to change its image every 6.94 milliseconds. So as the refresh is slowly updating, it's here at 6.94 milliseconds in that it's asked to change and show something else even before it's finished showing the original image. This creates an effect where one frame blends into the next and doesn't show the image clearly. Inverse ghosting occurs when a transition exhibits overshoot. It's basically the opposite of ghosting. Ghosting is usually seen as a darker, fainter trail behind a moving object. Inverse ghosting in comparison tends to be a brighter, clearer trail. This is because during the transition, the monitor is overshooting the target value, often to a brighter value, which lingers on the screen for a short period before falling back to the proper final value. In some instances, inverse ghosting can be worse than regular ghosting or smearing, as the artifact is brighter and more noticeable. The higher the overshoot percentage, the brighter the image will be, and the longer it typically lingers on screen. So at this point, we've described how we tested monitors previously and what the data often tells us about visual artifacts. Now it's time to talk about some of the flaws and limitations with this old way of testing. Let's go back and look at our response graph with a 10% tolerance applied at each end of the transition. This is all well and good, and when testing the same way with every monitor, it does give us nice comparative data. However, it doesn't capture the entirety of the transition, only 80% in total, which isn't sufficient for telling us the full scope of how long the monitor takes to transition. These limitations were brought up in an excellent video by Aperture Grill, a smaller YouTube channel dedicated to in-depth monitor testing. Last year, he published a video examining how we test monitors and why using 10 to 90% transition times perhaps aren't the best. It's a great video and worth watching if you're interested in more detail, so I'll leave a link in the description. Here's a basic explanation of why 10 to 90 transition times aren't great. Let's say you want to measure the time it takes to go from black to white. If we start measuring when the transition reaches 10% of the final value, we actually start measuring when the monitor reaches this shade of grey, and we stop measuring when the monitor reaches this value. In particular, what you'll notice here is that the start point isn't really close to black at all. It's a dark to mid shade of grey. The time it takes to go from black to that grey is not counted at all. That's not ideal, particularly for monitors that take a while to make that step. So the first solution we are making for testing 2021's monitors is decreasing the tolerance at each end from 10% to 3%. This means we go from capturing 80% of the transition in our response time numbers to 94%, a large increase. And if we go back to our visual example, we start and stop measuring at these values instead, which are a bit closer to the final values. We still do want some tolerance as the final portion of the transition up to the final value is not going to be that noticeable in practice, but this update is clearly taking into account more of the important part of the transition. But this alone isn't enough to properly capture the time it takes for a monitor to transition. For example, here you can see that while we stop measuring pretty close to full white, we still aren't starting our measurement close enough to full black. This is unbalanced. We are capturing more data in the bright part of the transition and less data in the dark part. The solution here is gamma correction, an innovation first described in Aperture Grill's video, and one that we will be adopting for our monitor testing with permission of course. His video goes into a full explanation of how it works, but again I'll try and simplify it here for this video. Back to our response time graph example. The basics of gamma correction is that we want to replace the brightness level output on the y-axis with the actual RGB values the monitor is showing. After capturing the monitor's gamma response, we can adjust the response curve appropriately. So now we are measuring the RGB value the monitor is outputting over time, rather than the linear brightness output. This is transforming our results to be gamma corrected. Now you may be familiar with the gamma function that all monitors and digital image systems use. There are plenty of resources you can use to brush up your knowledge, but the reason why we use gamma functions is that the human eye perceives light in a non-linear fashion. It's better at perceiving small changes in brightness in dark tones than it is in light tones. And this is obvious in our prior examples. While the differences between these light tones and these dark tones is 10% of the brightness range in both instances, the change in dark tones is much more noticeable. Gamma correction has taken advantage of this for decades, allocating more data to capturing differences in dark tones and less for bright tones. It's simply a more efficient way of doing things.
By gamma correcting our response time numbers, we are better calibrating our results to the way the human eye works. Instead of taking a 3% tolerance at each end of the linear light output, we can take a 3% tolerance of the grayscale RGB range. This captures more of the response curve again and has the benefit of taking a fair balance between dark and light values relative to how your eye will perceive them. In our visual example, the results are this. We've gone from taking a 10% tolerance of the linear output to a 3% tolerance of the linear output. The final step is taking a 3% tolerance of the RGB output, which as you can see is far closer to the initial and final values while being balanced between dark and light tones. This is an ideal result that will better match our results to the way you will perceive the visual experience of these monitors. I should note here that these tolerances are taken after accounting for the noise floor of our sensor, which is very low but doesn't go all the way to zero. Gamma correction also properly balances overshoot numbers. With our prior method using the linear light output, overshoot was being exaggerated for transitions ending in a bright tone and underreported for a transition ending in a dark tone. Calculating overshoot based off gamma corrected numbers properly balances that situation. Among a few other minor improvements to our test suite, I'm also going to be introducing a new data point that I've been wanting to use for quite a while and something Aperture Grill has been using that makes quite a lot of sense, and that's cumulative deviation numbers. What the heck is cumulative deviation? So I'll explain. Back to our response time graph example. First, let's plot the ideal response, which is a straight square edge that instantly transitions. Now let's say we have two transitions. Transition A is very slow to begin with, then quickly completes the transition. Transition B is very quick to begin with, but more slowly completes. If we measure the transition time for both of these transitions, what we get is the exact same value, but in reality, one type of transition is better than the other. When you think about it, transition B is closer to the ideal response because it completes more of the transition faster. Transition A will look worse to you visually because it's further away from the final value for a longer time. The solution to quantifying these differences is measuring the area between the ideal response and the measured response. We're calling that cumulative deviation a nice fancy name for a nice fancy data point. Cumulative deviation calculations produce a number that is smaller the closer the transition is to looking like an ideal instant response. This includes overshoot. Cumulative deviation numbers will be larger if overshoot is higher and takes more time to settle back to the ideal value. In a way, cumulative deviation is a great combination of both response time numbers and overshoot into a single value. Previously, we've shown both on charts at the same time as we wanted both response times and overshoot to be low, but decreasing one often increases the other. Cumulative deviation is just another tool in our tool chest that allows us to separate which monitors are better than others in how they perform, but it is more of a complex value, so it may only be something advanced buyers will want to take notice of. This is a lot of information to take in, but when we combine gamma corrected response time numbers plus a lower tolerance with gamma corrected overshoot numbers and now cumulative deviation, we have more data than ever before and a more accurate picture of how a monitor performs. For 2021's monitor reviews, we are introducing a new data table for response time information, which will present more data than before and give you clear insights into whether a display is producing good or bad performance. Let's work through it though and what we are showing off here. Along the top, we have three heat maps for our three key data points, up from two in prior years. The left is response times, middle is overshoot, and the right is our new cumulative deviation numbers. The response time and overshoot charts are basically the same as previous, except updated to use a lower tolerance and gamma corrected numbers. In this example of the AOC AG273QXP, you can see cumulative deviation in action. Roughly speaking, the results are a sum of the two charts on the left. This section of yellow response times on the left, but with zero overshoot, equates to these results in cumulative deviation. And this section of faster response times, but with higher overshoot, equates to similar cumulative deviation numbers. That's the beauty of this new metric in action, effectively combining the information of other charts. Below the chart, we have a row of key information summarized into averages. If you just want to know whether a monitor performs well or not, you can look at these four summaries and their corresponding color. Green means good, Red means bad. 
On the left, we have average response time information. The highlighted value is the average of all the numbers in the heat map above, and below that you can dial further down into information like average rise and fall times, best and worst transitions, plus the average dark level numbers, which is an average of transitions up to 102 on the RGB scale. In the left center, we have average total response times. This is another new metric for us, which measures the total time it takes for a transition to take place, including overshoot, with a narrow 1% tolerance. Normally, the response time numbers we show do not include the time it takes for overshoot, but total response time does, which may be a useful metric for some people. Below this is our refresh rate information, including the refresh rate and refresh window, the window being how long each frame is displayed on screen. Refresh compliance is a look at how many measured transitions complete within this refresh window. Right center we have our error metrics. Inverse ghosting rate is a measure of how many measured transitions exceed an overshoot of 15%. We've experimentally discovered that an overshoot of 15% is around where you'll notice inverse ghosting in practice. Below that is the average error, so the average of all the overshoot values in the heat map, plus the worst error recorded. On the right are the cumulative deviation numbers, the same types of calculations here as with average response times, but with cumulative deviation instead. We're not using a unit for cumulative deviation here, instead it's more of a, a score with a cumulative deviation of 500 being about average based on the monitors we've tested. The beauty of these new charts is that it does make finding the optimal overdrive setting easier. If we look for the minimum cumulative deviation level at a given overdrive setting, generally it gives the best balance of response times and overshoot. This also tends to give the best image quality when verified using qualitative methods like pursuit camera photos with the UFO test. Previously, we occasionally didn't have enough data or didn't have the right data to pick out the best overdrive modes. At times, the numbers would exaggerate how bad an overdrive setting was, when in practice using the UFO test, it wasn't as bad visually. Using cumulative deviation for this has solved all of this, and will lead to better recommendations for you throughout this year and beyond. Updating our results to use a lower tolerance and gamma correction has also removed incidences where two monitors would produce the same response time average, but visually one would have more ghosting or smearing than the other. This is because we weren't capturing enough of the response curve previously, and now we are, so now the averages we are producing much more closely fit with visual results, and increased accuracy is always nice. Finally, we were also able to significantly speed up how long it takes to make these charts. Previously for our old charts, gathering the data for each chart we showed in our videos would take 17 minutes. If we needed to test six refresh rates with four overdrive settings each, that could be up to seven hours of testing. Now we are gathering more data with higher precision and better accuracy in just five minutes or two hours for the previous example. That will allow us to test even more combinations if we want to, or focus on other areas of the review instead of waiting for response time testing to complete. And a lot of this is down to upgrading the actual hardware that we're using for doing these performance captures. Over the course of the last two months, I've been busy retesting all the monitors I have on hand with our new test suite. Currently, that's 22 monitors retested with a few more to go, but this has been a mountain of work to get done in addition to the regular content we make on the channel. But moving forward, this data is going to be a lot better, so it's definitely worth it. The question I'm sure a lot of you are asking is, how does this new test method affect your recommendations, and does it change which monitors are good or bad? In terms of comparative results, Provided we are using the same test suite and the same test method, generally speaking, this new review method doesn't change whether a monitor is fast or slow. VA monitors are still slower than IPS and will exhibit dark level smearing. TNs will generally be very quick. LG Nano IPS panels still produce pretty competitive results. Naturally, as we are measuring more of the response curve, the response times we report have increased across the board, and most monitors have seen an increase by roughly the same amount. As an example, the Dell S2721 DGF we reviewed previously had a peak response time of 3.84 milliseconds using the old system, with an average response time across the refresh range of 3.96 milliseconds, using optimal settings of course. With our new test suite, that's increased to 5.72 milliseconds at 165Hz and 5.54 milliseconds on average across the refresh range. Monitors that used to be in the 5 to 6 millisecond range are now 7 to 8 milliseconds and so on. There are a few exceptions where this test method captures behavior not seen before, so some results have changed by more, however the impact is pretty predictable with most displays.
With that said, having better data and more numbers to work with, in particular cumulative deviation, does give us better insights into battles that were previously close calls. With more information to draw on, at times there is now a clear winner. In other situations, two monitors that may have been separated on charts previously now come closer together depending on the metric. One thing that is crucial to note is that given we are now testing monitors in a unique way among monitor reviewers, I would not recommend comparing our results to results from other reviewers. If we say a monitor is a 5 millisecond monitor and another reviewer says it's 3 milliseconds, both can be right. It will just come down to the way it was tested. The most important thing is how the data stacks up within a reviewer's collection of reviews, where each monitor will always be tested using the same method. Here's a quick look through our updated comparison charts for 2021 using a section of the monitors we have retested. The first chart we're looking at is best gray to gray performance, which is measured at the display's maximum refresh rate using the best overdrive mode at that refresh rate. As I talked about just a moment ago, you'll see that results have increased in terms of raw numbers, however the general order hasn't changed too much. Higher end IPS panels like the Dell S2721 DGF and ASUS ROG Swift PG329Q remain up the top of the charts, along with TN panels like the HP Omen X27. Meanwhile, lower down we have more entry level options like the Pixio PX277 Prime and VA monitors like the Gigabyte G34WQC. The second chart we have is average greater grade performance, so this is a look at response times and overshoot on average across the refresh range, tested with the best single overdrive mode for variable refresh rate gaming. This is a key metric for those playing on a PC with either FreeSync or G-Sync enabled, as the refresh rate can vary. An interesting coincidence from this testing is that there is a glut of six monitors that performed within a 0.2 millisecond range, that's pretty close together. Next up is average cumulative deviation using our new metric that we talked about before. So this tells us how close a monitor's response time gets to the ideal instant response. Again, these results tend to follow what was seen in previous charts, but this will be a great tool to separate monitors that otherwise appear close on the charts. Our dark level performance chart has been updated to use an average of all refresh rates instead of just the maximum refresh rates, which gives us better information for adaptive sync gamers. A new method of testing can be quite punishing on unoptimized VA panels. Then our main response time comparison charts will be rounded out with two fixed refresh rate comparisons, 120Hz and 60Hz. This will give us a direct comparison between different monitors at the same refresh rate and could provide useful insights to console gamers that want to game at either 120 or 60Hz. We've also updated our input lag chart to show the response time component of latency using our new test methodology results. Anyway, that's basically it for our new monitor test suite for 2021 and beyond. Most of the focus here has been on response time testing. There haven't been major updates to the way we've been doing color performance testing, so not much to talk about on that front, but these widespread improvements to response testing should make our reviews more accurate and backed by more data, which is always a good thing. You should start to see the first reviews using this new methodology next week. We may at times bring back some old charts to do comparisons to monitors that we haven't been able to retest using this new method, but for the most part, reviews will be using brand new 2021 data. We do invest thousands of dollars and hundreds upon hundreds of hours into monitor testing, and we couldn't do that without the wonderful support of our Patreon and Floatplane members. So if you are interested in keeping our monitor testing up to date and independent, the best way is by supporting us in those places. Anyway, that's it. If you're interested in seeing those monitor reviews that should be coming up on the channel shortly, uh, the best way to do that is to subscribe. Floatplane as well will give you early access to some of those reviews from time to time, so that's well worth signing up there if you are interested. Um, thanks for watching this video to the end. If you're at this point, you're definitely part of the 20% club and you're definitely interested in learning about monitor testing. And this is something that I'm really passionate about. I really want to make sure that our monitor testing is the best that it possibly can be. So I really appreciate anyone that has watched this video to the end to learn about what we're doing on Hardware Unbox. I think it's pretty important. Anyway, thanks for watching and I'll catch you in the next one.